Well, good morning, church. How are we doing today? Good morning, church. There we go. There we go. This morning, as we continue with part three of our sermon series, Worship the King, we're going to talk today about God's gifts for forgetful people this morning. But to do that, I need to kind of bring in our object lesson for the day. And actually, I'm, I'm grateful for Dina Let me borrow her little bottle there. But um, actually, I actually found the bottle I used this morning. They left it for me. So um, how, many of you ever, how many of you have ever used hairspray before? Okay. All right. What is, ha- what is the purpose of hairspray? Keep to keep your hair in place, right? You know, if you don't have any hair, you don't, hey, James, this is for you. This is for big, sexy hair. Okay. That's the name of the bottle is big, sexy hair. So, you know, never know what will happen. Miles, you need a little bit of that too. Okay. Yeah, there you go. All right. So, you know, you, you take this hairspray and you put it on your hair and, you know, it fixes your hair so it stays in place, right? And, of course, in different times, this was a huge thing for people was hairspray. Okay. That's the purpose, right? We all know the purpose of hairspray. It's to fix your hair. Okay. But what happens when you put a can of hairspray in the hands of a 12, 13-year-old boy who's living in the country... It's the summer, there's nothing to do, and your sisters are driving you crazy. What do you do? Okay, well, hypothetically speaking, let me share with what you can do with a can of hairspray, okay? So let's say it's a Tuesday afternoon, and your sisters are driving you crazy, and mom and dad are at work, and uh, there's some trash to be burnt Um, outside in the trash pit because that's kind of what you do when you live in the country and there's no garbage service you burn your trash so just as all hypothetical speaking at this moment in time right so anyway so you're you're burning the trash and you know it's cool it's fire you know it's fun to watch and then you get this bright idea hypothetically speaking mom just bought this brand new thing of hairspray okay and I wonder what would happen if I took the can of hairspray and threw it in the middle of the fire. Now, again, this is all hypothetical speaking, right? So imagine what would happen if you took a brand new can of hairspray and you've got this big fire going in the middle of of the the garden area and you just kind of throw it in the middle. What's going to happen? So... So, so anyway, you know, after a few minutes, kind of waiting, uh, you know, again, all hypothetically speaking, of course, you know, you hear this big kaboom, this big explosion. Now, Mike Irwin's back there going, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Firemen don't want to hear that, right? So Steve's the same way. Okay? But anyway, you, you throw it in there, and you hear this big, loud kaboom. Now, when you're a 12 or 13-year-old boy, that's the most awesome thing in the world, Right? And you ask yourself, let's do it again, right? Okay, so, so fortunately, you know, how, how, again, hypothetically speaking, you know, propose that maybe your dad, like, owns a chemical business, and there's lots of empty or half-empty aerosol cans on the shelf from, from cleaning, and you go, let's see what happens with this, and this, and this. <laughs> it's awesome, y'all. Again. When you're a 12 or 13 year old boy living in the country and there's nothing to do and your sisters are driving you crazy. So anyway, so, so we all know that's not the purpose of hairspray, right? Okay, that's not the purpose of hairspray. And what, what you begin to realize is when you, when you take something and you use it for a purpose that it was not intended for, bad things could happen, you know? See, the principle that we want to embrace this morning is this. Everything has a purpose in this world. But when you forget or ignore that purpose, bad things could happen. Like, for example, again, hypothetically speaking, right? Um, Your two obnoxious sisters, one older, one younger, decide to rat you out to mom and dad. Yeah, they still... Anyway... But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. So what we want to do is look at what happens when we misuse things, when we miss the purpose of things, right? So as we look at part three of our series, I Worship the King, here's what's going to happen, all right? We want to apply this principle that everything has a purpose, but when you misuse the purpose, bad things can happen, okay? We want to apply it 
to our worship life. How does this help us understand the purpose of worship? Okay, And how does it get us from a place of, do I have to go? Do I really go? I probably should go to that attitude of enjoyment like, I can't wait to go. I look forward to going. I'm excited about going. How does it help us move so that it's no longer a struggle that of being here and being present with other believers in worship? So to illustrate that, because some of you might be going, what does that actually look like? If you will, for just a moment, let's turn to Psalm 84. Okay. So if you want to pull out your Bibles, go ahead and pull your Bible out. Let's go to Psalm 84. It's also printed out in your handout. And again, you've got page one and then page three. So skip over page three and go to page two and then go back to page three. Okay. Everybody got that? All right. So let's look at Psalm 84 this morning. Okay. Beautiful Psalm. It's written by one of the psalmists. It's not King David, but it's, it's, it's this group of, of men who are songwriters for the church back in the Old Testament called the Korites. And so they write these pieces of music that are to be sung in the church, right? And Psalm 84 goes like this, verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Verse 2. My soul longs for it. In fact, I will even pass out if I don't get to be there for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for the joy to the living God. My, my heart and my flesh, they sing for joy to the living God. See, that's, that's somebody who's like can't wait to be in worship, who can't, can't, he, this person can't wait to be in the presence of God. You're not having to force them there. You're not having to convince them to go, but they have that attitude of like, I'm not here because I have to be here. I'm here because I want to be here. Now look at verse four. <clears throat> Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, right? The blessing comes when we find our strength in the Lord, whose heart are the highways to Zion. That, that phrase highways to Zion means these are people whose heart is drawing them to God. And so they're on a pilgrimage, a journey to where the temple is located there in Zion. Verse 8. I'm sorry, verse, yeah. Now skip down to verse 8. O Lord God of hosts, Hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Why did people go to be in the presence of God? Because they knew when they were in the presence of the Lord, God would listen to them. They could offer their prayers and God would speak. Now verse verse 9. Behold, look, see, God is our shield. He's our protector. Look on the face of your anointed one. That is the Messiah, the Deliverer. Now jump down to verse 10. Here's our key verse. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. A day in your courts is a thousand elsewhere. Do me a favor for just a moment. I want you to pick your dream destination and location in life. Like if you could go there right now, where would it be? Hawaii, where else? Huh? Scotland? Ooh, that's a good one. Where else? Huh? New Zealand. Oh, great place, right? Anybody else? Australia. Where else? Huh? Bora Bora. There we go. Uh, the Caribbean, maybe. Cozumel. Yeah, right? We love Cozumel. Anybody else? Some mountain people here? We go the Rockies, the mountains? Huh? Alaska, right? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do. Here's what the psalmist says. Listen, you pick your dream destination and location. And you had a ticket that said you get to spend the next thousand days there. Now look what the psalmist says. He says, spending one day with God is better than those thousand days. Now get your head around that for a moment, okay? You take a thousand days in your most favorite location. And the psalmist says, one day with the Lord is better than that. 
One day with the Lord is better than that. In fact, he would say this. If all my job was to be is to open the door of people who are coming into the house of God, I would do that more than anything else. Because I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God. Why? Now here's the why. Why is it better to have one day with God than to spend a thousand days in a dream location? Why is it better to have one day with God than a thousand days in my destination trip? Why? Because the psalmist knows something that he wants us to embrace this morning. He knows God's purpose for gathering with him. He knows the purpose behind our life together. See, here's this, and here I want to I unpack that for just a moment. Here's the purpose. When we think about the purpose of worship, I kind of introduced this last week, but I'm going to repeat it this week. The purpose of worship is so that God's people can gather in the presence of Jesus. That's what makes it better. One day here, then a thousand days elsewhere. Because when we gather here, we are in the presence of Jesus. Okay? We're in the presence of the Lord. For two reasons. To receive His gifts and to respond to His grace. So I come so I can receive what God wants to give to me. His love, His forgiveness, His word, His hope, His encouragement, His grace, His mercy, His strength, all of His wonderful gifts through word and sacrament. But I also come so that I can respond to His grace. So that my heart and flesh may sing out and cry to God. That I can pray to God, give an offering to God, serve God. So here's what we're going to do. The next two weeks, we're going to just unpack this simple concept of what it means to be in the presence of Jesus together as God's people. So that the end goal is this, that you start to believe this, because I know this to be true, right? We're not there yet. Okay. We're not there where we would go, listen, a ticket to be with Jesus for one day or a thousand days to be in dream location. All right. Because I know James, James is sitting there thinking, a thousand days of elk hunting in Alaska. <laughs> right? Yeah, amen, right? Because we're all that way. How do we get there, though? How do we get to that place where we honestly, in our heart and mind, go, God, I want to do, if all I can do in this life is spend one day with you in your presence. It would never compare to a thousand days in my dream destination. How do we get there? That's what we're going to do for the next two weeks. How do we unpack this together as God's people? But to do that, okay, so here's what we have to do. The first thing we have to do is this. We have to tell, we kind of have to identify what worship is not before we can really unpack the purpose of true worship, okay? So let's unpack for just a moment what worship is not, okay? Now, I've been around for a long time, been a lot of different worship gatherings, talked to a lot of different people about worship, and I'm just going to summarize some basic things that worship is not, okay? All right? So let's kind of walk through these together, all right? So number one, worship, <laughs> oh boy, worship is not about what I want or what you want. It's about what Jesus wants, okay? Okay? That's a hard one because we often pick places because we want to listen to a certain preacher or we want to sing certain songs. And it can't be about that. It can't be about that. Worship has to be about what does Jesus want for my life? What does Jesus want for my family? What does Jesus want to give to me today so that I may live fully for him tomorrow and the next day? It can never be about what I want or what you want or what, even what we want as a church. It's got to be about what Jesus wants. Okay? Number two, there's a real danger in today's iPhone society. And here it is. When we begin to reduce worship to listening to a sermon or singing songs, okay, both are acts of worship, but they're not worship. Okay? Worship is not about just singing some songs. 
even though we love to sing. It's not about listening to a message. That's coming from a preacher, okay? See, what happens is, if you reduce worship to singing some songs and to listening to a sermon, guess what happens? You can do that anywhere you go, right? You can download a thousand sermons. You can have an entire playlist of all your favorite songs, and you never have to come back. If that's what worship is. But it's not. It's not. Worship is about gathering with people. It's about being in the presence of Jesus. It's about engaging in the work of the people. See, the church had this right a long, long time ago. They developed what was called the liturgy. And what liturgy means is the definition of liturgy is this. And you can write this down if you want. The definition of liturgy is this. It's the work of the people. That's what liturgy is. Okay? It's not just simply the things you got printed out in your bullets in here as an order of service. Liturgy literally means work of people. So when we come to church, now this is going to really kind of blow your mind. You come to work. You come to work. You come to work out your spiritual muscles. Okay? Now listen, I don't, I honestly believe this. Like, I kind of wish you would all leave tired when you leave here. Okay? All right? That's just true. All right? I want you to leave tired and refreshed. Now, and here's what I mean by that. Have you ever ever had a really good workout before? Like, Like, you're tired, but you're refreshed. It feels good. Okay? You work out. You're tired, your muscles are tired, but you're refreshed and you're energized. That's the way worship should be, okay? I don't want you to be tired because you're overburdened. I don't want you to be tired because we've just poured a bunch of law on you. I don't want you to be tired because you're just more stressed out about the things that you're not doing or should do, right? I want you to be free when you leave this place. I want you to be encouraged when you leave this place. I want you to know that you're loved and your God is gracious to you when you leave this place. But I also want you to work out your spiritual muscles, okay? Because if we don't, guess what happens to muscles when you don't work them out? They atrophy, right? That's why the liturgy is called the work of the people. So when you're in the pews, what do we do? We engage. We read together. We say things back and forth. When I'm praying, you're praying. And when you're praying, I'm praying. When we're singing, we're singing together. We're working it together, church. It's never meant to be just kind of you listen to us and you just sit there. It's a work of the people. Now, here's the beauty of it. The Bible says there are eight components to biblical worship. Okay? There are eight things that God's, that God's people do when they gather for worship. Let me, I'm going to walk you through them just real quickly. You can write them down if you want to. Number one is pray. We pray together. That's the first thing. When God's people get together, they pray in all things and for all people in all situations. Number two, hey Tom, would you check the air in here? It's just a little hot in here. Would you, um, the second thing we do is we baptize and we celebrate communion, the sacraments. We break bread. We eat and drink for God is with us today. Number three, we give an offering. We give an offering. We give something back to the Lord for his work. Number four, we hear God's word. For the last 4,000 years, whenever God's people got together, there was a public reading of scripture. Number five, we confess our sins. We confess our sins and we receive the absolution. Number six, we confess our faith. He who confesses our faith before men, God will confess before in heaven. Number seven, we sing. And number eight, we hear a message. Those are the eight biblical components that are throughout the scriptures that God says this is worship. Okay? This is worship. It's why, especially the longer you kind of are in a place like this, and you go somewhere that's maybe all they do is sing and hear a message, yeah, it may be a great message. And yeah, you may love the music. And yeah, God is present and active and working. No doubt about that. But you may walk away. You may find yourself walking away occasionally going, there's something missing. There's something missing. It's not that it was bad and not that it was wrong. But you may just have something inside your spirit that goes, something was missing. You know, I've been here for 15 years now. Is that right? Yeah, 15 years. 15 years. Almost 16, right? And one thing I can say is we do communion every week. 
And so if I go a Sunday to a place of worship that doesn't have communion, I now have this deep longing and missing in my spirit that something is missing. Something's missing, okay? And so we begin to see that together, that, that it's not just about singing songs, and it's not just to hear about a good message. The truth is, there's an act of worship by God's people, all right? Then number, the next one is, we, don't, we miss the purpose of worship if we see it simply as checking off a religious activity, or it's just a time to catch up with friends. None of those things are bad, but they're not what worship is. So what is it? Worship is about gathering with God's people so that we may be in the presence of Jesus. Why? Because it's better. It's better. One day with Jesus is better than a thousand days elsewhere. You want to know why? Ask Zacchaeus. He spent one lunch with him, with Jesus, and his life forever changed. Ask Paul. He's on a road. He meets Jesus in a light. His life is forever changed change. Ask Peter. Peter who rejected and denied Jesus three times is restored in one afternoon by Jesus. Every single time in the scriptures that Jesus encounters somebody their life is forever changed. That's why it's better to be in one day in God's house than it is anywhere else. Because as the psalmist says in verse 2, you have a soul and your soul longs for Jesus. It longs to be in the presence of Jesus. It longs for something that you cannot get anywhere else. Why? Because as verse 12, 11 says, God is your son. He is your shield. He bestows favor and honor, and he doesn't withhold anything that is good. God is your son. That means he lights, he brings light to the chaos of your life. He brings light to the dark places where you want to hide. He brings light and hope to things that you need the most. He is your shield. He is your protector, your defender. He protects you against the accusations of Satan. He protects you against the temptations of this world. He is your son and he is your shield. And you know what he'll do? He will not withhold his good and gracious gifts. See, there's a truth that I want to make sure we kind of get today. All right? It's one that I hope everyone can go, yeah, that's me. And here it is. We are all forgetful people. Amen? How many of you would agree with that statement? We are all forgetful people. Now, if you don't have your hand up, you're a liar, okay? And so I will prove that to you in just a moment, okay? All right? Everyone in this room is a forgetful person, okay? And here's why, okay? Now, how many of you use sticky notes to remind yourself where you put things? How many of you use sticky notes to remind yourselves of an appointment or to do something at work? See, why do you do that? Because you're forgetful. You won't do it. How many of you have alarms that remind you to get up in the morning, take your medicine, you have an appointment, you got to leave now to get somewhere on time? How many of you have alarms? Okay. Why? Because you're forgetful and you'd miss everything if you didn't. Okay. Now here's the key one. How many of you have ever used password retrieval? <laughs> there you go, right? Why? Because you're forgetful. We're all forgetful people. We have sticky notes. We have alarm reminders. We have password retrievals. We use all kinds of systems so that we will not forget things. We send ourselves text messages to remind ourselves not to forget something, right? We do these things. So let me make it clear. Jesus is your sticky note, your alarm reminder, your password retrieval, and your text reminder all rolled up into one. Okay? And here's why. <clears throat> the Christian life is about one of reminder. Because as the Christian, we often forget things. In fact, we daily forget things. Let me ask you a question. And just to show you how this works. See, worship is about coming to be with Jesus, really, not to learn something new, but to be reminded of what you forgot. 
It's to be reminded of what you have forgotten, what you have ignored, what you didn't get thought to, and what you have left undone this week. Now watch. I'm going to show you how this works, okay? How many of you have had a moment this week where you have been on your knees, in prayer, with tears in your eyes, confessing your sins, and acknowledging that you are a poor, miserable sinner and you have blown it this week? How many of you did that this week? Wow, right? Guess what? You didn't do it because you forgot about it, didn't you? You got busy and you forgot about it. So what do we do when we come to church every Sunday? We remember what we have forgotten during the week. I forgot to acknowledge that I was a sinner. I forgot to acknowledge, confess my sins before the Lord. I forgot to be on my hands and knees with tears in my eyes, confessing to God, this is how I have fallen short of your glory. We have forgotten those things. And so we come here to remind ourselves of what we have forgotten. How often do we go through the week forgetting to take time to hear God's Word and to listen to God's Word? Some people are better at it than others, but the majority of people will go days, if not weeks, if they weren't in church, reading their Bible or listening to the Bible. So why do we come here? So that we can hear God and be reminded of what we have forgotten. How many of you have forgotten that God is in charge? That He's in control? That He's the King of kings and Lord of lords? How many of you have let fear drive you this week? How many of you have allowed the situation to, rather than God be in control and trust Him to work it out, you're trying to fix things on your own? Right? We all do, at some point or another. So you know what God says to us? Let's pray about it and talk to him about it. And oh yeah, let's confess. Who is he? He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the creator of all the universe. He's in control and you can trust him. Why? Because you forgot it this week. Right? How many of you have forgotten this week that you can actually trust Jesus with everything? Right? We all do. We all do. How many of us have forgotten to keep our eyes fixed on Him? To love our neighbor as ourselves? Oh yeah, most of us probably. And so we come here so we can fix our eyes on Jesus and be reminded to love our neighbor as ourselves. How many of us have forgotten that God loves us, cares for us, suffered for us, died for us, rose from the dead, and is alive? See, church, the truth is, here's how Satan likes to work. He wants you to forget, ignore, not give attention to things that are true that God has done for you. He just wants you to get be busy with all the details of life that you have forgotten about Jesus. And so we come here to be reminded of what we have forgotten. We come here to receive God's gifts of love and grace and hope and encouragement, peace and joy. We come here so that God can remind you, because otherwise you'll forget it, it's better to be what, church? One day in the house of God than a thousand days elsewhere. Can y'all say that with me? It's better to be one day in the house of God than a thousand days elsewhere. you got to be reminded of that because you'll forget it. you got to be reminded that God loves you and has sacrificed everything for you. So you know what he does? He says, take, eat. This is my body, broken and shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink. This is my blood, broken, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take, eat, drink, and remember. We come here to remember that there is no other name upon this earth by which we can be saved. And so have you ever noticed in worship how many times we say this little phrase? Let's make our beginning this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I forgive you of all your sins. By the stead and command of my Lord Jesus. What church? Say it with me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And one more time, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we are reminded that there is no other name by which we are saved. There is no other name that we call upon for grace. There is no other name by which our sins are forgiven. There is no other name by which God gives us life and hope and encouragement and trust for the future there is no other name so we come to be reminded of what we have forgotten let's pray lord we are a forgetful people and so we come here not always for the right reasons not always for the right purpose. And all we can ask is for your forgiveness and for you to teach us your ways. And because we are such forgetful people, we don't trust you. We don't love you. We don't love our neighbor. We leave things undone and left undone. We don't ask for forgiveness. We don't seek your mercy and grace. So all we can do is come here every week and just say, God, give me what I need and what I have forgotten today. I need your body and blood. I need your word. I need your reminders. I need your proclamation. I need your truth. I need your hope. I need your grace. I need you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And we all say together, amen. Amen. Let's stand.